Next up, we have uh, Dr. Anna Rubenstein. Uh, Dr. Rubenstein is the current director of test and evaluation at Project Maven. Um, you might have heard about Project Maven from one or more places. I believe uh, um, Defense News called it the flagship AI project in the DoD yesterday. Um, I've heard it called a number of other names also. Um, Dr. Rubenstein has a PhD in chemical engineering from Princeton. Uh, she previously worked as a science advisor at DARPA and a research staff member at IDA. Um, and has done work including development and testing algorithms for atmospheric modeling, data fusion, social network mapping, and nuclear weapons modeling, so a wide range of places. Today, uh, Dr. Rubenstein is talking to us about methods of measuring computer vision algorithms that support various different stakeholders. Um, with that, uh, Dr. Rubenstein, are you ready to go or do we need a little more uh, space filled for slides to get set up? Um, I, think, I think we're ready, um, but I don't know why the slides aren't showing. Well, while we wait for the slides to get up, I realize I didn't say anything about okay. myself. I just assumed everybody knew who I was. So I'm Chad Bieber. I'm currently the Director of AI Assurance Operations at the Joint AI Center, uh, working for Dr. Jane Pinellas. Um, I okay. am sad that I couldn't be there in person, um, but COVID and other things uh, stood in my way this year. Um, and hopefully we'll get to meet in person next year at DataWorks. And where are your slides now? There. Oh, okay. Great. <clears throat> okay, so thank you so much uh, for that intro, Chad. Um, so I'll jump right in. Um, I want to take a couple of slides and just introduce the company that I work for, uh, which is Morse. That stands for Mission Oriented Rapid Solution Engineering. And then I'm going to give a little bit of an intro to T&E and AI. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because Colonel Willie did such a great job in his presentation. I can piggyback off a lot, a lot of that. Um, the bulk of the talk is going to be about computer vision, vision metrics and uh, why it's so complicated to pick the right ones uh, for, your, for your use case. And then I want to talk a little bit about teeny capabilities. So actually, you know, once you choose those metrics, how do you actually, how do you actually feel them and implement them and measure them effectively? And then if we have time, we can talk about some lessons learned at the end. So, um, so to introduce uh, what Morse is, um, we are a small company of scientists, engineers, and software developers who work on problems for the national security ecosystem. Um, we, are, we are located in Boston. Um, I am not. I am here locally and always have been. Um, and there are a number of values here that I want to hold up. And I'm going to use Morse as an example throughout this presentation, but not for the purposes of, of pitching Morse specifically. But I think there are a lot of values here and frameworks and lessons learned that are going to be important and resonate with anyone who really cares about delivering Teeny as a service. And I know that that's a lot of us here in this room. Um, so all of, all of the data and products that we develop belong to the government. Uh, we have no uh, proprietary uh, things that we hold dear, we, we share it with the government. Um, we, we try to be smart, efficient, lean, you know, happy, agile, rigorous, and passionate and invested in this mission. And then this uh, slide just gives you a sense of the breadth of work that uh, Morris works on, but we're primarily focused on this talk today on the T&E and AI portion. And here, okay, so introduce, introduction to T&E and AI. So um, our, when, the way we approach this at Morse is uh, threefold here. We try to be transparent and have unambiguous metrics uh, the, that we provide to vendors and the government for decision making. We have open standard interfaces that enable self-serve integration. So that kind of gets at that speed and scale pieces that are important to us. And um, also that, that fast turnaround time. It's important to get that feedback as soon as possible so that vendors can react and work at uh, making models that are more productive and useful uh, to users. And then uh, for this talk today, you know, AI has a broad spectrum that it can cover, uh, you know, natural language processing, time series forecasting. But here today, I'm going to focus on computer vision. And even more specific than that, I'm going to be looking at object detection for full motion video as an example. And then, uh, you know, within the AI project life cycle, we can see where T and E fits. You know, it um, it can often be used as a gatekeeper of figuring out which models are best for deployment. Um, but then it needs to feed back into that loop. Um, you know, taking taking those lessons learned, taking that data back, and um, and really harnessing that to leverage the full capabilities that are available to your to your AI model. 
And then here uh, is showing the, the testing pyramid. Um, Colonel Woolley presented this in a, in a different format and actually broke his up into, into four pieces. Uh, I do it in three. Um, and so we have, you know, algorithm teeny at the bottom where that's your testing your models in your sandbox with your curated, uh, you know, t and &E data sets. It can be a heavily automated and scalable process. And you have system teeny where you plug your, your models into the actual system, the hardware, the networks that it's going to be running on, making sure that, you know, you've actually implemented everything correctly and that it's still behaving the same way that you predicted in algorithm teeny. And then operational teeny, making sure that the system is usable, useful, and desirable for the end users. You know, is it making them faster? Are they finding more targets? Are they finding better targets? And then how, how do the, the humans and the systems actually interact together? Um, and so, so for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to dive a lot deeper into algorithm teeny and the kinds of choices that we've had to make there to really facilitate um, model development for the DOD. And so this, this shows you a picture of blowing out that testing pyramid and sort of peeking back under the hood of everything that goes into an algorithm. And you'll see that the right metrics choices vary depending on what you're looking at, which layer of, of capability you're trying to test for. And so that is what I'm really going to dig into in this section. So computer vision metrics. So I might be preaching to the choir here, but I think this is surprisingly complicated you know, it seems like it ought to be easy. There ought to be an objective right answer. Like, what is the best model? Why can't you tell me? Why can't you tell me which one is the most accurate? And why doesn't that, you know, check all your boxes of what you're looking for? But it's really not that simple. And then, you know, specifically for, for object detection models, accuracy isn't even defined. You know, there is no concept of a true negative. So how do you even approach what best could mean? Uh, sometimes you have to back into it using a few different metrics. And so, um, you know, what we've, what we've found is things that sound good on paper, you know, and that, you know, like great academics can come up with, like, this is how you have to do it. A lot of times it just does not work in, pap in practice, and uh, you, you just discover that by trying it out and, and failing and, uh, you know, trying again. So precision and recall are often really good jumping off points, and they can start to give you an, an introductory understanding of why users might enjoy working with a particular model, but they, they're not the whole story. They're not the complete picture. And sometimes you can't even get to those more complex metrics until you've already sort of established some basic level of goodness um, you know, at, the, at a simpler level. So for example, if you want to do tracking in a video, you can't even, you can't even touch that conversation until you've gotten just basic, you know, you know, within a frame detection, correct. And then, you know, getting at, getting at to how, how do you answer that question of which one is the best model. Sometimes you want to roll up a number of different, um, you know, performance aspects into a, single, into a single value that you compute. You know, that's easy, that's simple to understand, you can point to it. But how do you really effectively do that, especially when you're looking at considering a number of different object classes? And you get a real trade-off there between the simplicity of having a single number and then the transparency of understanding how that number devolves into a number of different aspects. So I'll start with defining precision and recall because those are the two sort of building blocks of a lot of the metrics that we use in computer vision. So precision. Um, it tells you a lot about the quality of your detections. So in this example, it's looking at what percent of the detections are correctly identified as dogs. So you see here two out of five. So two of the five <coughs> detections are correctly identified as dogs. In this slide, we're looking at recall. So that tells you more about the, um, you know, the object class that you're particularly looking at. So here, what percent of all of the existing dogs were successfully detected? So here you can see that three out of the five were picked up. So that's 60% recall. Okay, so that all makes sense. But what does that really mean? What does that look like when you start combining these features of a model together? So this example shows perfect precision and low recall. So you can see that everything it told you was a dog was in fact a dog. However, it missed, it, you know, it missed most of the dogs up there. Is that sufficient model performance for you? I don't know. It depends on your use case, right? Like if you only want to be, you know, get that tip and cue from a model when it's absolutely sure it's correct, then this might work for you. However, if you, you know, if you absolutely have to be notified anytime there's the remotest chance that a dog is there, this probably isn't going to cut it for you. So here's the opposite example. So this is perfect recall, low precision. So here, it picks up every single dog on the screen. However, it's also flagging a lot of uh, false positives for you. 
is this acceptable for you? Maybe, maybe not. Um, so it just really depends on what that use case is, which can make it complicated when you're trying to develop models for a general use case, because then you have to start making trade-offs. How do you balance these two? So um, <clears throat> one way you can understand that trade-off between precision and recall is with a PR curve, because the, the unseen third dimension here is the model confidence. So you can set different confidence thresholds and that will let you map out this full curve. And that shows you the full, the full range of capability of your model. Um, and that can be, that can be useful to, to model vendors, understanding you know, where, how, how they are performing in general. Um, and then this is a really common metric that's often used for computer vision is average precision, which measures that full shape under the curve. Mean average precision would be averaging over all the different object classes your model output. So this is all well and good, but in a lot of cases, the user never experiences that full breadth of potential model performance because the model operates at a single fixed operating point. And so if you really want to reflect and optimize around that point, uh, that full, the full curve doesn't matter because the user's never going to see that. So one way of getting at that operating point a little bit more, uh, more, more directly is with an F beta score. So here we're showing where, an F, where the beta value would be one. So this would be a harmonic mean of precision and recall where precision and recall are equally balanced. So this could be a metric for a real general use case where precision and recall are equally important to you. So you can see you know, this, this behavior here is giving you a, a value of about 0 .5, 0 0.545. Um, and, you know, and visually, that could make sense to you, right? Like it's getting about half of the things you care about, a score of about 0.5. You know, that resonates. That's easy to understand. It's intuitive. So, but maybe, maybe that's not enough. If you're doing, if you're doing, you know, uh, if you're running an algorithm over a whole video, maybe you don't care just about that frame-to-frame -frame importance. You know, academically, that, may, may, that might make sense. But when you're actually watching the video, what if those detections are flashing in and out and distracting you? And you're like, man, I wish that algorithm could just hold on to something, hold on to the identification frame-to-frame -frame and have that persistent identification so it's not flashing in my face. So, this happened on one of the programs we work on. And so we started using this additional metric called track fragmentation. And so the, the reason of starting to surface this was to tamp down on that flashing, that ID switching that was so distracting to people. So this measures the number of unique identities assigned uh, per minute. Um, and so you can see in this example here, this would be 30 fragments per minute. Per minute. So that would be a lot of switching. So, so now, you know, we've talked about a detection metric and a tracking metric. Again, how do we start to roll these up into decision metrics when we're trying to decide what is the best model? Um, and there are a lot of trade-offs that you need to make here. So, um, and so there are a number of different answers or, or directions you can use to try to do better at this. So one is that normalization can be really helpful when you're trying to weight different things together. So you see here we have, you know, F1 on the bottom, track frag um, on the y-axis. Track frag is not bounded. So it can be really hard to say, you know, what, what is a good track frag score and how do we pair that with a good F beta? Um, so, so you can come up with strategies for normalizing um, even unbounded things. You have to pick a, you know, a dampening factor, and, and that can be somewhat arbitrary. Sometimes we don't like making these decisions, but we have to. Um, and then also, you know, user interviews can help, can help you with prioritization. Um, and so that's something that you, know, you and a lab can't decide. You have to take that to the users and, and get their feel on it. But they might be able to give you better insight on, you know, what that trade-off is to them between an F beta and, and track frag, for example. And then whatever, whatever solution you do decide on, you should do some robust analysis on it to make sure that there aren't gaping holes somewhere that you haven't considered. You know, you don't want your, your metrics to be susceptible to gaming, uh, where the vendors could be, you know, meeting the mark in terms of the number that you asked them to optimize on, but it could be, you know, they could be, by doing that, they could be introducing a whole bunch of other behaviors that are really going to be detrimental to a user. So, um, you know, once we, once you've, um, you know, accepted the level of complexity up to this point where we're trying to find a better way of doing 
uh, detection and tracking. You know, an additional more complex, more comprehensive metric that we looked at is average track accuracy. So I don't have a pretty slide here with dogs to explain this one. It's getting more complicated. But, uh, but it measures you know, how well a map track matches a ground truth track um, by at, with it, uh, considering the average IOU over all frames. And it scales by the number of detected tracks and the number of ground truth tracks as a way of penalizing missed and phantom tracks. So you can see a head-to-head -head comparison here of these two different uh, types of metrics. You can see that ATA adds um, a number of different failure modes that it's looking for and trying to tamp down on. So this, um, again, uh, raises the bar, moves the carrot a little bit for the vendors, um, and really gets at that spatial alignment that, you know, on its face might not seem so, so important if the detections are close. Why isn't that good enough? But if you're actually trying to use the information the AI is giving you, especially in real time on something like a video, those spatial alignment things can be really important and can really matter to you. Okay, so let's say you've come up with a good metric for your one class. Now what do you do when you have multiple classes that you're trying to weight and consider the value of? So something, something simple and easy to do is to just average them all together. And that can make a lot of sense when you have um, you know, performance in different classes that are, that are pretty similar and equally weighted. But you know, what happens as you continue to add different classes that have really variable performance? You know, would an average of the performance across all of these different classes still be meaningful? Does that really tell you anything about how you as an individual user might want to use this model? And then, you know, as you, as you continue to add, what if you're adding classes that are, um, that aren't very populated in data? Does that, it's not necessarily telling, it's telling you more about the state of your data than the performance of your model necessarily. But again, how do you, how do you take all of these different classes into account? And um, I don't think there's any one-size-fits-all solution here. It will base on what the priorities of your users are and the priorities of your program. You know, if you're fo focused more on R&D at that moment than producing something functional for a user, you might make different choices about which of these classes you care about. And then um, switching, switching gears a little bit uh, to something else that um, Colonel Woolley talked about is confidence reliability. So, this is something that can be a very, a very gnarly issue because it's, it's something that seems like it makes sense to a user but is often really misinterpreted, and that is what the confidence of the individual detections are. A user wants to look at that and say, okay, well, if the, if the AI says it's 95% sure that's an airplane, I believe it, it's an airplane. But you, know, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily take everything a human told you at face value either, you know, and you shouldn't, but I think we expect models to be a little bit more self-aware. Um, so. So, you know, ideally the confidence output would exactly align with the measured precision, but actually a model's output often deviates from this. And you can, you can measure the error between those curves, you know, and you can quantify it by how many examples that you have, and you can come up with metrics. We have ECE, uh, expected confidence error, that can help you sort of get a sense of how off a model is. And if you surface that to a vendor, they can try to take that into account and make some adjust adjustments in the, the confidence values that they output. So hopefully, um, you know, the, those numbers start to actually reflect what users often interpret them to mean. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about some t &E capabilities for how you could actually implement those metrics um, successfully from a, from a t &E as a service perspective or an enterprise-wide t &E, uh, perspective. So at Morse, we've built a number of different tools to get at different pieces of this. We have Charybdis, and that's kind of our Swiss Army knife of T&E capabilities. We have Metal that enables Charybdis to run um, uh, using parallelization, so really quickly. We have Proctor that does the scheduling and resource management of the computational resources, and we have Gradient, which turns all of those t &E results into visuals. So I'm gonna dive into Charybdis a little bit. Um, the, the reason why that name was chosen is because Charybdis is a sea monster that is eternally hungry. So you can think of our capability as um, you know, being eternally able to consume models and to spit back out uh, these, these teeny results. And so it was, it was developed out of a need um, because no off-the-shelf package would really deliver the full suite of capabilities that we were looking for. And it's ultimately, it's a framework. It's a, it's a flexible and dynamic framework uh, for doing T&E analysis of CV applications. 
and so it's modular. Everything is plug and play into the system. So I'll highlight that here. So um, in terms of the CV object types that it can ingest, it can handle bounding boxes, polygons, pixel masks, and that's important. It's important to be able to be flexible across those. What if your models output bounding boxes, but you know half of your labeled data is is polygons? You know how do you how do you mesh them together? Well, Charybdis can handle um, you know all of these different types of of object types, and it even allows customization, so you can program in your own shape files. It also has different mapping strategies that might also depend change depending on your use case. You know, how do you choose if you have multiple boxes overlaying a ground truth? How do you choose which one you map together? Is it the best intersection over union? Is it the best confidence? Um, you know, you the user is allowed to choose those kinds of things. And if anything that's native available, native uh, natively available isn't what you want, you can program your own choice. And then in terms of the metrics themselves, um, a number are preloaded. Um, some you know very common ones that are used across many programs, but if you need to customize your own, you can. And you can also uh, figure out how you want to apply those metrics. Do you want to apply it over every object or every frame or across an entire sequence? You know, different different choices make sense for different types of models, and you're allowed to to uh, facilitate those with Charybdis. All right, so just wanted to take a few minutes and talk about some best practices that have been learned um, over time here. So as, um, as Colonel Woolley mentioned also, operational testing is the most important, but it's the slowest. So you know it's easy to push that off until the end, but that's not the best way of doing it. It's really better to do it as early in the process as you can, even if you have something that's not fully functional yet, just to start getting those lessons learned so you don't get too far down you know, the rabbit hole that's taking you in the wrong direction of something that's not gonna be important to users. So try to do it as early as possible. You know, automation is very key to moving quickly and cheaply, and a lot of the lessons learned I highlighted here already, a lot of the, the frameworks that we've built um, are built specifically to facilitate this, this speed, um, because we don't, you know, we want things to be sitting with, with, you know, humans as little as possible, and passing that information back and forth um, quickly is, is very key to getting rapid innovation and success. Um, it can also be really helpful to integrate computer science drops before proper model drops. And so what's meant by that is if you have a lot of system integration, it's good to, um, to do a drop early in your sprint cycle that you know, doesn't have the fine-tuned weights that you'll get at the end of your sprint, but has enough of the infrastructure there so that um, you know, if you need any, to get any certifications to field, any certain IA processes that you're trying to run, you can do those early and up front and then substitute in the, uh, you know, the final model weights at the end, but that can um, help identify a bunch of software and interface bugs early, which is really important. And uh, so another one is, you, know, you wanna decide on your decision metrics before you start model development, um, but you have to be open to improving and evolving over time. As I mentioned, a number of the different metrics that we've used, we could not have possibly known why they would be important or necessary at the beginning. So it's something that you should always be looking at. I think each sprint, um, you know, taking a critical look at what you've learned, how far the models have come, what users are asking for, and then, you know, making a choice based on that. And then, um, and then it's important to calculate all metrics, even if you do just calculate, you know, even if you do calculate those decision metrics that are very, very rolled up, it is very important to unroll them and to look at what the, you know, performance on the different components is, because you don't want to, to blur things and lose that transparency about how models are actually performing. A lot of that nuance can get erased if you're not careful. Um, and then, you know, data splitting is important. You want to have test train and validation set splits, make sure they're balanced and representative, and be very, very careful about test set contamination. Um, because, you know, once it's, once it's lost, you can't, you can't get it back. And it's, it can be a good idea to have a strategic reserve that you hold um, just in case uh, mistakes like this happen, because unfortunately, you know, it, it, it does more than we would like. And then um, just another note is to be wary of cloud costs. There's a real conversation to be had about the trade-offs between you know, on-prem compute resources versus the cloud. Cloud costs can you know, scale quickly, um, and so you need to, be, need to be cognizant of them. And you also need to think about how you want to manage cloud resources. Do you give it to the vendors themselves so they can have that rapid scalability you know, at will? 
or you know, do you trust them? Do you trust them with the budget? Do you want to hold that closer to yourself? Um, you know, again, that those are conversations that just need to be thought of the most effective way uh, to do these things. All right, and this is just um, some link to available libraries for um, for computer vision metrics. So with that, I will stop there, and I think I probably do have time for any questions. Thank you, Anna. And while Caitlin checks to see if there are questions in the room, um, I, I love the description of Charybdis as being eternally hungry. I don't think I'd heard it actually defined in those terms before. Um, I see that Charybdis is available to the government. Do you know if Maven has a plan for how to release or distribute those to interested parties? I don't. I don't know that it would necessarily go through Maven specifically or through, uh, through Morse, but if anyone, you know, reached out and was interested, we could have that conversation and set that up. If we were interested in um, put it, making them available through Iron Bank or one of the other government distribution uh, methods, is that something that you think they might be interested in? Or do you want to follow up with me and, and see if that's something we could check into? Um, yeah, I know I've heard Iron Bank mentioned before, so we can we can check in on that and I'll see. Thank you, Caitlin. Do you have any questions from the room? Howdy, Sam McGregor with uh, Afotech. So you mentioned using the computer science drops to work out bugs and all that sort of thing beforehand. The next step up I'm seeing is that what if you're getting systems interacting where there's no bugs in the systems, but the interaction between those systems is creating bad inputs? How are you handling that? Can you give an example of sure. what you're thinking about? So one of the examples I was reading about was an ATC system, air traffic control, for it was designed for the United States. However, it was applied in Britain. The problem being with the latitude longitude system, with there being zero right there, the system could not handle that. So it was, ended up putting effectively the coordinates for one town over another. Huge issue, right? How are you countering that in your systems? Right. So we haven't encountered that too much just because the the models that we've developed plug into UIs and systems that are also developed for our program specifically. But absolutely, I would expect issues like that to happen if we were um, integrating even farther afield than that into third party systems, other programs of record. So issues like that are going to happen when you try to do these integrations. Um, and I think it would just be, you know, trial and error. I mean, I think I think both sides would need to communicate as much as possible about, you know, what the outputs of one system are and the inputs of another. Uh, but there are going to be missteps like that. And I think you just have to, um, you know, to, to be on the lookout for them and make sure that all your outputs make sense. Hi, Brianna Anderson with IDA. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to how Charybdis handles learning over time specifically. So these models aren't static, right? They're, they're learning. And, and so I would imagine that the metrics um, are changing as well. And so how, within your data sets, are you handling the change in the metrics and the learning over time with these programs? Right. So the so to be to be clear, the models, the models, mm, the way they're deployed, they are deployed frozen. So whatever weights have been tuned up to that point are frozen, and that is how it is is deployed into the field. So once the once the models are are deployed into the field, they are not changing anymore. But each sprint, each 90 days, the vendors are taking all of the additional data that has been provided you know, by the program and tuning their models to make them even better. So there is continuous improvement, um, but just with different model iterations. Um, and so each sprint, we do, we do another round of T&E where we look at the model performance you know, over any additional capabilities that have been developed. So if there are new uh, object classes that it can handle now, you know, we look at that. We, um, we compare it to performance on the previous sprints model um, on that updated data so that we have a really accurate baseline. You know, we use that to set goals. Sometimes we even benchmark against, um, you know, human level performance, what we would expect on some of the different object classes. And, um, and, and that increase in performance is 
often what we do to say like, okay, is it time to add additional metrics? Uh, when vendors got really good at, you know, the F beta and track frag, it's like, okay, well, how do we, like, we know the models visually aren't perfect yet. Like what more do we need to be adding? What are we missing? What are we not, you know, putting into math and asking them to do that is still important to users. And so that's when we introduce ATA and that's new, but that is, um, you know, designed to get more of those, the spatial alignment pieces. So even if the model isn't more or less correct than it used to be, if it looks better to a user, like that still matters. That still makes the data easier to, to interact with and use and process. So, um, so yeah, so as the models get better, we definitely are taking that feedback to see what more can we do? What are we still missing? And we have time for one more question from the room and then we're going to move to Tyler. Hey, um, Chris Heineck from NASA. Um, when you're talking about with the doing the CS bugs and trying to work those out first, I imagine that's before you have a model and so you're using some kind of stand-in model. Um, do you find yourself doing uh, just one model that's sort of kind of realistic or do you find yourself having maybe a suite of models that have very specific things that it pretends to do? Um, what, what's kind of your uh, process for making those fake models? Right, yeah, so you do you do want to do the computer science drops, you know, early enough that you have time to work all your, your kinks out, but not so early that you don't have a realistic picture of what your model is ultimately going to look like. Um, so the vendors are able to submit as many models as they want. Since we have this scalable fast process, it is no problem for us to churn through them as quick as they can make them. So they would, they could, if they're, if, the various architectures they were considering, if they varied significantly, they could submit a bunch of different prototype models and we could test integration with all of them and get all of them, you know, like conditionally approved and then whichever ones ended up being the best to field, those are the ones we would go with.